All right, so today we're going to continue our discussion of chapter 14. And specifically, we're going to cover diagnostic and emerging biotechnical therapies. Okay, so here's an overview of what we're going to be covering. Uh, we're going to go over the learning objectives. I'm going to go over, um, uh, well, answer any questions you may have. We'll talk about rapid tests. They're also called point of care tests, specifically agglutination and ELISA. And then we're going to talk about polymerase chain reaction, PCR, and CRISPR because, you know, CRISPR is the hot new thing. And then we'll talk about what to do for next time. All righty. So uh, this chapter helps us move toward being able to fulfill the following learning objectives, being able to define the key role of evolution as it applies to microbiology, identify microbial structures and connect the structures to their functions, identify key agents and processes of microbial information transfer, identify pivotal components of microbial systems important to human health, and analyze and describe the impact of microorganisms. And I do not have a question slide, that's cute. Okay, so any questions? <laughs> okay, if you think of any, let me know. I'm happy to answer them. Okay, so we're going to start out talking about rapid tests. Okay, point of care tests or POCTs. Okay. So the two that I'm going to talk about um, rely on agglutination and ELISA techniques to um, provide the diagnostics. So let's go to the whiteboard and we will go over some of those. And I'm going to stick to some of the more common ones. Okay, let's start with the glutination. Okay, a glutination takes advantage of the ability of antibodies to agglutinate or clump okay, pathogens. So, how does it do that? Okay. Say in the body, because we're going to start out in the body, I've got some bacteria here that have gotten into the tissues through the break in the skin. How do I antibodies clump these guys? Yeah, how do these little Y-shaped guys clump bacteria? Oh, come on, somebody must know. Okay, apparently we're too shy to, to answer this one, but it's because we have two variable regions, okay? And so each of these can grab a hold of a different pathogen, okay, different cell, and clump these guys together, okay? So that's what happens in your body and it makes it easier for phagocytic cells to phagocytize large numbers of bacteria or viruses or whatever, um, all in one goal. Okay? So what we do for tests that make use of this is we take advantage of what antibodies do and we use it to um, identify potential pathogens or 
anything else that uh, we need to know um, in um, in uh, clinical situations. So, for example, blood typing. Okay. Before we give somebody a transfusion, we need to know what blood type they are. And we have four major blood types and a whole slew of minor blood types, okay? And they all relate to antigens, proteins, that are found on the surface of red blood cells. So just for the sake of simplicity, I'm gonna draw them as the letters that we have designated them. Okay, so this is an A, uh, type A blood cell. We also have B, okay? So that was the second type that was discovered, okay? And then we have folks that have both A and B, okay? And then we have those that because of mutation, um, there's no A or B antigens on the surface and we designate these guys as O, okay? So how do we use agglutination to do blood typing? Okay, which is very rapid. You can do that um, right there while the patient is sitting there. So what we do is we get antibodies that are uh, specific for binding either A or B. Okay? Uh, there's also a, a minor one, B, that's uh, RH positive and negative. Okay. So just for the fun of it, we'll put some Bs on here. Um, so what I do is I take the Take a sample of the patient's blood, okay? And uh, generally there's some controls because it's good to use controls. And uh, I have antibodies and we'll say that these orange ones are specific for A and then these pink ones are specific for B, okay? And we call these so the antibodies that will bind to the B antigen, we call anti-B, short for antibodies against B. Okay? And these guys that we, we would call them anti-A. Okay? So I take blood and I put them in these little wells. And then I put the antibodies in. So I would have um, a control where there's A, there's B, and then there's the patient. So um, with this one, there's if we don't actually put blood in, we put, uh, um, and well, and this is a, a good enough test that sometimes we don't include controls, but it's good scientific method to, control, to include controls. So um, I would actually have little latex beads that are covered in A or covered in B because you know you don't want blood expires and all sorts of stuff. So latex beads are better. So I would put anti A in this one, and I would put anti B in this one. Okay. And I have not done nearly enough wells. Let's go ahead and get some more wells. Because I've got to have the patient sample in two of them, because I'm going to do the same thing here. Okay. I'm going to put anti. A in here, and I'm going to put T B in here. And the expected result is that there's going to be clumping. Okay. If I have a bunch of A blood cells, okay, my anti A is going to be able to, well, let's try this thing. It's going to grab a hold of more than one cell and it's going to clump those. 
So I would expect to see clumping okay, in my positive. Okay? And so in A and to B, I would expect to see the same thing. Okay? Now, if I get clumping when I add anti B, but I don't get clumping when I have anti A, then we know the patient has type B blood, okay? Because here I put anti A in, but because um, this patient is B, okay, we'll say that, uh, let's go ahead and put two B's here instead of Um, the anti A antibodies are not going to grab a hold because they are not specific for the B antigens. Okay? They're specific for A antigens. So they're not going to grab a hold and the blood's not going to clump. Okay. So that's how we use a, um, uh, a rapid test. You can do this and you see the clumping within seconds. Okay. And generally, we put them on a rocker so we get good mixing between the yeah, anti antibodies and the sample. Okay? And then, if we didn't have any clumping, the patient is O. If we have clumping in both, they're AB. Okay? And then we generally have a, a third test to see if they're RH positive or RH negative. Okay, questions, questions about agglutination. Yes, sure. Is that a, is agglutination a term that can be used um, for in other ways? Like for instance, on the news this morning, I saw that they have a new medication for babies that um, have COVID and it mentioned that it clumps together, the, it, it clumps the pathogen so that it doesn't continue, you know, flowing through the, the body. Would this be kind of that same type of uh, idea? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because it's the same thing that what the poor little baby's body would do if they were able to, if they already had antibodies against COVID. So, you know, you have a poor little baby and I'm just going to do the COVID and, um, uh, you know, just little red dots here. Um, so, and I didn't hear this on the news, but this sounds very interesting. Yeah. Um, so I suspect what it is, is it's what we call a monoclonal antibody. And so these are the antibodies that we make in the lab that are specific for just one kind of antigen. And so what's happening is these antibodies are grabbing a hold of the virus and causing clumping. And so that neutralizes the virus because you know, if I draw this big and leave the envelope off, um, the antibodies are not only clumping the virus, but they're grabbing a hold of the spikes. And once they grab a hold of the spikes, then the virus can't grab a hold of the host cell and can't continue to infect the lungs of the poor little baby. So then would it eventually flush out of the body somehow, uh, like once it's um, neutralized? Kind of, yeah, because if it's neutralized, it can't grab a hold, so it mm -hmm. can be flushed out. But generally what happens is a big old macrophage comes along and swallow these guys down. And then remember they're going to go over to um, the lymph nodes and other places where um, uh, a cells and B cells, not A cells, B cells and T cells hang out. I had A and B on the brain here. <laughs> and uh, they're going to display bits and pieces of uh, COVID so that the baby's immune system can get a boost, you know, kind of like getting a vaccination. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of how cool. we flush out, yeah, the, the virus. All right. Thank you. Oh, ah, quite welcome. Yeah, they, uh, I had heard yesterday, and this may have been the same broadcast, um, they've just approved uh, these monoclonal antibody medications uh, for babies. Uh, it had been approved for adults and children 12 years and older, but they just recently got approval 
um, for uh, babies up to, I think they said a week old or something like that. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. That's the same. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't hear that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard that yesterday and I went, oh, cool. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this would definitely be a glutenation. Yeah, glutenation is a fancy, fancy term for plumping. And we can use this technology for any pathogen or any antigen we're looking for. Okay. And so um, we'll see a glutenation used, you know, for blood typing, like in this example here. Um, uh, back in the day, we used to use it for, um, uh, you know, like uh, testing for strep throat. Uh, we've moved on to a different rapid test technology for those kinds of things. But, uh, yeah, we can still use a modified version of this to have, you know, to help you out in your body. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay, let's talk about Eliza. And I've seen, seen this spelled with a Z or with an S. It depends upon. Uh, anyway, I've seen it I've done both ways. But this is a test that uses antibodies to grab a hold of antigens again and uh, let us know if it's present. Okay. And so ELISA stands for um, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. That's a mouthful. Uh, ELISA is a whole lot easier to say. Okay. So I'm going to give you two examples, and then we're going to transfer that to rapid tests. Okay. So we're going to start out with how uh, we used to do it and sometimes still do it um, uh, in what I affectionately refer to as back in the dark ages. So <laughs> this was not a rapid test, by the way, but you know, that's generally how we start out. We start out with um, a test and uh, once we get it refined, then we can move from, from the long version. Okay, two rapid tests. Okay. So uh, let's say, you know, back in the dark ages, um, I was testing to see if folks who had received um, a vaccination or hepatitis B okay, had zero converted. In other words, were they producing enough antibodies that uh, they would be protected against hepatitis B if they had an accidental needle stick or some other fluid to fluid contact with the patient. Okay? And I was doing this, you know, 99.9% .9 uh, with uh, clinicians, okay, folks who were working in, in a clinical field. So we had kits that were already pre coded with hepatitis B surface antigen. Okay, so yeah, uh, you know what? That's impossible to read. Hepatitis B surface antigen. So on the hepatitis B, it's, it's the big old spike, okay? Like on uh, with COVID. And so the bottoms of these wells would be coated with the antigen, okay? And so thank goodness I didn't have to do that. It was far enough from the beginnings of developing um, Eliza that uh, I didn't have to do this part, came from the factory this way, okay? Uh, but, and so we are looking for a specific antibody, okay? We are looking for anti-hepatitis B surface antigen, okay? Uh, because the, the vaccine actually um, has uh, uh, the bioengineered vaccine, okay? 
um, where we get E. coli to make three antigens, but we test for this big scary antigen that most people are going to produce most of it. Okay? So in your blood, okay, in a patient's blood, they're going to have all sorts of antigens okay? or and all sorts of antibodies. Okay? So they may have antibodies against hepatitis B surface antigen. There's also antibodies against the two minor antigens that we vaccinated for. They've also got antibodies against staph epi. They have antibodies against, um, you know, E. coli, you know, so you've got a lot, a lot of antibodies in your blood, okay? But we're just looking for one for that specific test. So what we would do, once again, we would have a positive control well, and we'd have a negative control well, and then we'd have the patient samples, okay? So for the positive, actually, let's switch this around so I don't have to do the, uh, the, the patient sample again. So we're going to put the patient here, and we're going to put negative here and positive there, okay? So I put some serum, some blood, okay, where we've spun it down, we've removed red blood cells and uh, other clumpy stuff. So we have just the fluid portion of it. Then in the negative well, I'm going to put from the manufacturer, I'm going to put some fake serum in that has no antibodies, okay? And then in the positive well, I'm going to put some fake serum that has just the antibodies I'm looking for, okay? So these go in here and the appropriate antibodies are gonna grab a hold of this surface antigen, okay? So, oh, you know what, that's, that's too big and scary. We're gonna show these individually again. So all of the anti-hepatitis B surface antigen antibody is going to bind, but I'm also going to have all of these other antibodies floating around, but they're not going to bind, okay, because this is not the antigen that they are set up to look for, okay? but they're floating around in here, okay, so there's no antibodies in here, and in this one, I've got all sorts of antibodies binding to the surface antigens that are in the bottom, okay? So what we do is we wash, okay? We go through and we wash and we get rid of any unbound antibody, okay? Now, here's the enzyme-linked part, okay? Oh, by the way, I'm doing um, an indirect ELISA as an example, because um, that's what most, most of us use, okay? Because the direct is kind of expensive. You generally only saw that um, at the beginning when they were first developing this, okay? So then what we do is we put in fake serum that has antibodies against human antibodies. So they are called anti-human. Spell it right. So what we do is we take the uh, um, for any human antibodies. Remember, this part is um, for the purposes of this class. This part is, is all the same. Okay, we call this the constant region or the FB region. Okay, and it's the same for all humans. Okay in little bunny rabbits, okay? So I'm gonna get my, my lab animal here. We'll get little bugs going here. Um, so if I inject human antibodies into the rabbit, their immune system is gonna recognize it as different because their FC portions look different. And they're going to produce a whole bunch of antibodies against human antibodies. 
I know that seems a little uh, seems a little redundant. <laughs> but what you do is you uh, inject that into a rat or a bunny. We now have bacteria that make it for us through recombinant DNA. Um, but we get a whole bunch of anti-human antibodies. Okay? And what we do is uh, in the factory, we attach an enzyme. Okay? So I need to get my little Pac-Man going there. Okay. And this, this is an enzyme, but we've attached it to the antibody, okay? So what we do is we put a whole bunch of this, whoops, I gotta switch color. Uh, we put a whole bunch of this into both wells, okay? And they're going to grab a hold of any human antibody that happens to be in there. So this is the indirect part, okay? Because the detection system is not binding directly to the antigen, okay? So in the negative well, I don't have any antibody. I've rinsed everything out. So the enzyme that has, or the uh, antibody that has the enzyme is not going to attach. But it will in my positive well. In, in this case, it's gonna attach to the patient well. So we rinse it again and all of this goes out. Okay? Any unbound um, antibody is going to be rinsed away. Then we add the substrate. Okay? So remember that a substrate goes into the enzyme and a product comes out, okay? And uh, back in the day, we would have a substrate that was colorless, clear, but once the enzyme did its snip, snip, snip thing, it would turn green, okay? Uh, some melizes, they have it that, that'll turn blue. Um, Back in the earliest days, it would turn yellow, but let me tell you, spotting that yellow is, is harder than you would think. So I personally prefer the green or blue, okay? So we put this, let me get rid of my patient sample here. So we would put in the substrate into all three of the wells. And until this point, there's a whole lot of nothing visible going on. All of this is happening on a microscopic level. So that's why we run controls is to make sure that when I'm washing, I'm not sloshing my positive into my negative. Because if that happens, I could be sloshing my positive into the patient sample. Okay, so we always run a negative control between the positive control and the others so that I can make sure I'm doing it right and I'm not cross-contaminating between the wells, okay? Now, since I have enzyme in here, the substrate is going to turn green. And it's gonna turn really green here because it's positive control. This should stay clear, okay? And you have readers, okay? Because now we have machines to do what I used to do by hand that go through and wash everything Okay. And so I've got my positive control here. I've got my negative control here. I've got all of my patient samples through here. And so I look for green. If my positive control is not green, or if my negative control is green, then you dump the test because you know something went wrong. But then you go through and the machine reads the positives versus the negatives, then you write up a report. Okay? Cool, right? Now this is considered indirect because I have antibodies detecting antibodies. Or if I were looking for antigens in the patient sample, we can also do an indirect test looking directly for hepatitis B surface antigen to see if the patient is a carrier for hepatitis B you would do the same thing, okay? You've got antibodies detecting stuff, okay, that have the enzyme. 
if we were doing direct, okay, um, then we would put in antibodies um, again. Uh, well, you'd have uh, just one layer here, okay? So you would have antibodies against human antibodies, and then now let me back up. It's a whole lot easier for detecting the antigen to explain this. So the antigen gets stuck, and then you put in an antibody against the antigen. But uh, that means you have to have enzyme means antibodies for all the different things you're looking for. And that gets kind of expensive. If you have this one anti-human, then you have just one vial. It's useful for any antigen or antibody that you're looking for. Indirect is less expensive, and it's a whole lot easier to manage. Okay. Now, having said that, when we get to rapid tests, okay, we're going to talk about two of them. Okay, the pregnancy pee on the stick. And they're generally this shape. They've got a window here. Okay. And you put the sample here. Okay, in this case, it's urine. And we're looking for a specific hormone that indicates that a woman is pregnant. Okay. So once again, we've got controls. So we have. Um, antibodies that are here waiting, and they've got this. Um, this one's a direct test, and they have uh, the, the, the enzymes okay, that will change colors when you get enough of them. So, when you get enough of these grabbing a hold of a specific spot, then you get a color change. And uh, the urine causes the antibodies to flow. Okay? And generally, with most pregnancy tests, they will have a line show up, okay? And uh, so that means the test is working. Now, if you don't have that hormone in your urine, these antibodies are just going to go right past, okay? And you're not going to get another line. If you are pregnant, these antibodies are going to grab a hold of a strip here. So it's kind of like the antigens here. The antibodies that have bound the hormone in the urine are going to grab a hold. And when you get enough of them, you can see this horizontal line that ends up being the cute little positive that lets you know that you're, that you're pregnant. Okay. I went through that kind of fast. Any questions? Okay, we've got the same thing happening with COVID tests. Okay, you've got the well where you, you put the fluid, okay, and that fluid um, has, uh, well, part of it's just fluid, but you also have antibodies and all sorts of good stuff. And then you have the swab that you rotate around in both nostrils. You put that in there, you rotate it to mix the fluids, and then everything wicks up toward the window. And once again, you have a control. So if you don't see that first line show up, that means that the, the test didn't work and you need to do it again, okay? Because the fluid didn't wake up or um, the, the, yeah, flu, the antibodies in there got overheated or something and they're no longer working, okay? But if you get a second line, okay? Just like the pregnancy test, that means positive, okay? If you don't get that second line, you didn't have the antigens off of your swab or not enough antigens to form a visible line, and it's considered negative. Okay, questions about these ELISA rapid tests, these point of care tests. So is urine the substrate? Uh, the urine is the test sample. Oh, just test sample. Yeah, okay. and then we have the substrate down here. So it's kind of okay. like we're doing this, but we're running it past one area instead of putting it in the wells. And we don't have the rinse steps because we're doing a direct rather than an indirect. Okay. Yeah, so um, the hormone in the urine 
binds to the antibody and then it gets wicked up and it'll grab a hold of another antibody that's here ready to grab any antibody that comes past. So actually I said it was direct, but it's actually indirect. You just don't have the root step. Yeah, and generally, instead of having an enzyme, they have a little colored weed kind of thing that will cause this to, to clump and you can see it. Um, there may be some, some color metric stuff going on. I'm not as familiar with these because, you know, I've used them for COVID. We've all been using them for COVID, um, but uh, I was not involved with making them or getting them set up. Whereas with the old method, yes. I did that for many, many years as a graduate student. <laughs> hey, other questions? Okay, let's go on to PCR, and then I'm going to ask you questions. Okay, polymerase chain reaction. Okay. This one goes clear back to chapter five, where we talk about DNA replication, okay? So what we do is we take the enzymes, okay, that cells use to replicate their DNA, and we get it to do that same thing in a cell-free environment, okay? So real quick, let's review how your cells make more DNA, okay? So remember, we've got double-stranded DNA. We've got to separate these guys, okay? And then, and a helicase separates them. And so then we get primase that makes a primer, okay? And then DNA polymerase sits down. And it chugs along, chug, 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 chug. Okay, and it makes a new strand. Okay, so for each original double strand of DNA, once we get done, okay, we started out with one strand, one double strand of DNA. But when we get done with replication, okay, we have two double strands of DNA. So for each cell division, we double our DNA, okay? Makes sense, right? Let me go ahead and label my stuff. So uh, we make a primer, okay? And uh, the DNA polymerase, okay, brings in nucleotides, okay, that have three phosphates, um, and it hooks them together in the right order using the old strand as a template, okay, and let's go ahead and get helicase in here, okay, so it's doing the unwinding, and then we have other um, enzymes, Okay, that come in, DNA polymerase one that comes in, removes the primers, puts in DNA. We have DNA ligase that comes in the heals all the nicks, puts it all together, okay? So when we do PCR, we are doing this in what's called a cell-free environment, okay? Think test tube. But actually, we're doing it in itty bitty little vials that have this cute little snap lid. Okay. So, what we do is we put in a sample. Okay. Say I've got a drop of blood and I want to make more copies of the DNA that's in there. So, I put my sample in. And then I put in a DNA polymerase. Okay, that comes from a um, extreme thermophile. Okay, we isolated um, 
Thermophilius aquaticus, okay, from a, a hot spring in Yellowstone. And uh, its polymerase can stand high heats, doesn't denature, okay? So we put that in, okay? And then we put in a whole bunch of triphosphate nucleotides. So I'm gonna put P3 because, you know, it's uh, easier than drawing this out, okay? So, and I, you know, and I've got uh, ATGC, okay? So I put all of these in to my little reaction vial, okay? And then I also put in a primer. So instead of putting trimase in to make the primer, okay? Which is gonna make the primer at, at the origins of replication, Okay, to start out with, and then it's going to do it at random spots. Well, when I'm doing this for PCR, I generally don't want the whole genome. That's a whole lot that would take forever. Right? Usually, I want just a specific gene that I'm going to use to identify something. Okay, whether I'm identifying COVID. Okay. Or if I'm figuring out, you know, who's the person that left the blood splatter at the scene of the crime, okay? Or if I'm doing a paternity test or any of these kinds of things, I'm usually looking for um, just one gene. We'll say that. Nowadays, we look for multiple genes at the same time, okay? Um, if you send in a sample to say 23andMe or Ancestry.com, uh, we're looking in the range of uh, about 60 genes that they look at at the same time because things have gotten automated and we can, you know, uh, look at things faster and easier. But for the sake of simplicity, we're going to say that I want one gene. Okay? So I'm going to have a DNA primer that I've made in the lab that it's at the beginning. Okay? And then I'm going to have another one that's at the end. Okay. So I'm gonna put the primers in. Okay. So I have all of this in my little vial and I put it into a machine called a thermal cycler. And what that does is instead of using helicase, okay, we use heat to separate the strands of DNA. Okay. So in my sample, I've put my sample in, I've got all sorts of chromosomes in there. Okay, and my, we'll say this is a blood sample. Okay. Or we can say that this is, uh, well, it's not going to COVID yet. Okay. So what happens is we use heat to peel these apart. Then, as things cool down a little bit, okay, my pack, Thermo aquaticus, Thermophilius aquaticus, okay, uh, DNA polymerase that is heat stable will come in, okay, and wherever the primers have attached. Okay, so we get my primer attaching here and here. And so, that tack is going to grab a hole and fill in okay, that stretch of DNA okay, until it falls off. But it's going to do it just for the specific gene that I'm looking for. Okay? So with the primers, okay, it's specific for the gene I'm looking for. And so we do rounds of this. We heat it up. We peel these apart. We cool it down a little bit. DNA polymerase makes use of these uh, nucleotides, makes a stretch wherever the primers bind, okay? And I get a bunch of copies, okay? And the math for this is exactly the same as for figuring out how many bacteria we get after replication, because the same thing is happening. So if I start out with one copy, after one round of the thermocycler, I'm going to have two. After two rounds, 
I'm going to have four. Okay, so for each cycle, I double the number of copies of the DNA. Okay, cool, right? So then we use this. So the whole point is, um, you know, why in the world are we doing this? Okay, if I have just one copy of a stretch of DNA of interest, okay, that is too little for me to perceive that with my equipment or with my eyeballs. Okay. If I make millions and billions of copies, that's enough that I can I have something to work with. Okay. So it's kind of like PCR is kind of a photocopier. Okay. For DNA. So there's a number of things that I can do with this while, you know, once I get a whole bunch of copies. Okay. Um, in some applications, we take the samples, um, we put it on a, a gel, it's kind of like jello, thick jello. Okay, and I've got a little well cut in here, and I put the samples in my well. And then, um, because DNA is negative, okay, so it's negative up here, I put a positive current running, for, well, I put a current that runs from negative to positive. So the negative DNA is going to be attracted. And depending upon the size of the fragments, I'm going to get these bands, patterns, okay, that we can use to identify. Okay? Um, so if you ever hear the term DNA fingerprint, this is what we're talking about. Okay, Separating out the fragments so that we can see a pattern. Okay, So it's like a fingerprint, but it's DNA and it's unique, you know, pretty much. Okay. So we can do this. We can also tag these nucleotides so that they fluoresce, so that we can do what's called real-time PCR. So as the thermal cycler is making more and more copies, and we have these labeled nucleotides, we've got sensors that can read the fluorescence. So we can see, oh, okay, yes, we have this many copies based on how bright the signal is of our target okay and from what i understand that's what we do okay for covid testing okay when you go in for a pcr test we generally do real-time pcr where we're making copies of the covid genome okay but we're tagging the new copies with a label so that at, over time, we can see whether the sample gets brighter and brighter, which means there's COVID genome in the original sample, or it stays dark, which means you're negative. Okay, cool, right? And then sometimes if we're figuring out something new like the Human Genome Project, we can take all of these copies and we can do what's called sequencing, DNA sequencing. Okay, to determine the order okay, of uh, A, T, D, C, D, D. Okay. Um, but that's a whole nother thing and you don't have to worry about that other than knowing that it exists. Okay. So we can use PCR for all of these different things. Okay. All right, any questions? Questions about PCR? Okay, are you ready for me to ask you questions? Oh, I was going to tell you about CRISPR. Never mind. Let's go to CRISPR. Because CRISPR is the wave of the future. Okay, CRISPR is a incredibly long, uh, an acronym for an incredibly long uh, term, a uh, descriptive term that I'm not going to bother to to explain to you. Okay, and a lot of times we will talk about CRISPR Cas9. Okay. And what we've done is, once again, we've taken enzymes that come from cells and we make use of them for our own purposes. Okay. So 
CRISPR comes from what is kind of the immune system of bacteria, okay? So let's say I've got a little phage, okay? A little bacterial virus that uh, grabs a hold of a host bacterium and it injects its DNA into the cell, okay? Now, if everything goes the way the phage wants, okay, the bacterium is not going to notice that it's there and uh, the phage is going to be able to come in and it's going to chop up the bacterial chromosome. And so the bacterium is basically dead. It just doesn't know it yet. Okay? And so the phage can make more of itself, make phage parts, and eventually it will pop and release more phages out into the environment, looking for another bacterium to infect, okay? Well, that's the story that we told you in chapter six. A little more complicated than that, okay? Sometimes the bacterium realizes that foreign DNA has been injected into it, okay? And it has some enzymes that we also make use of called restriction enzymes. And they go, you're not purple DNA. Chop, 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 okay? And they kill this puppy before it gets a chance to infect it, okay? So restriction enzymes are bacterial enzymes that chop up foreign DNA, okay? So then what they do is they say, I'm gonna remember you. So they take these pieces and they put it into their own genome. And it's a history of all of the viruses that they've been exposed to, okay? And so the researchers that were looking into this um, cause, uh, called this uh, region of, of uh, something repeats. Anyway, so it's a region where we've got a whole bunch of these little pieces of phage DNA that have been inserted into the genome, okay? And so what the bacterium does, and this is where we get to Cas9, okay? They have an enzyme. Well, they have a series of enzymes, and Cas9 is the ninth one that was discovered. And what the bacterium does is it makes a copy, an RNA copy, okay? We call this the guide RNA. And so here's this enzyme that has this guard um, RNA and it runs around scanning, whoops, I've got the wrong color, scanning all of the DNA inside of the cell, okay? And it's programmed not to recognize this area because, you know, we don't want it removing this record of successful um, uh, surviving of the pages, okay? But uh, they run around and they check all of the DNA that's floating around. So if I get another one of these, Cas9 is gonna come in and go snip, 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 okay? So what we do, okay, when we take advantage of CRISPR, okay, what we do is we make our own guide RNAs. We take Cas9, we make our own guide RNAs, and we use that to find specific sequences. And we've also modified it so that it can put new genes in. So it's like a guided missile or a scalpel, okay? So let's say that I have a patient. Let's go ahead and get some respiratory epithelial cells here, which look an awful lot like my um, brush cells from the intestines, okay? So let's say that, um, that this is a patient, and I'm gonna make the nucleus bigger, um, that has cystic fibrosis, okay? 
So they have in their genes, okay, here's a very short chromosome. Uh, we have, all of us have transporter proteins, okay, that move chlorine in and out, okay. And folks who have cystic fibrosis, okay, um, have a mutation in this. And so uh, their transporter protein doesn't fold quite right. Okay? And so it never gets out of the proof checking region of the endoplasmic reticulum. So it builds up in the, in the ER of the cell. And we have very few that end up making it to the surface. And so there's a problem with chlorine transport. And so mucus that is produced is very thick, okay? Because if you don't control your ions very well, you don't have water moving the way it should and you get very thick mucus. The cilia have a hard time moving the mucus so you get mucus buildup because you have mucus buildup it becomes hard to breathe and you tend to get a lot of infections because bacteria, and viruses that are getting stuck in the mucus are not moved out. And so they tend to build up, okay? So that's probably more about cystic fibrosis than you wanted to know. So what we're talking about doing, okay, is developing some CRISPR that has guide RNA for the healthy gene, okay? And then they would bring in um, information on the healthy one, okay? So the CRISPR goes in, sits down, and marks the spot. Okay, here's where the mutated gene is. And it goes SNP, okay? And so there are repair enzymes that come in and uh, we generally attach them to the CRISPR. And so they can get rid of the mutated gene and make sure that we get a copy of the non-mutated gene in. And so then the patient has properly functioning, properly folding calcium transporters, okay? Uh, so we're looking to, uh, to cure some genetic diseases this way, okay? Uh, but there are ethical considerations. Okay, so if I have somebody, okay, who is a carrier, okay, for cystic fibrosis, and we'll go with, you know, we'll say it's a woman, uh, we could, in theory, use CRISPR, okay, to remove all of these um, recessive genes for cystic fibrosis, so that none of her children could get cystic fibrosis, okay? Uh, yes, Michelle. Does that work for, are they doing that for like other kinds of fibrosis or are they just doing it for cystic fibrosis right now? We're looking at cystic fibrosis and other diseases that are caused by one gene. So other examples would be sickle cell anemia. Um, mm -hmm. Another one that's called severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID, bubble boy syndrome. It's caused by one gene. Uh, fibromyalgia and, and the other fi fibroses um, are generally caused by more than one gene. So we're kind of waiting until we get the one gene diseases taken care of, and then we're going to tackle the more complicated ones. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. It really is. Thanks. Does, does a mutation cause... Um, immunosuppression disease like lupus and things like that? That's one that is complicated. Um, we do find that lupus and other immuno uh, um, autoimmunity diseases do tend to run in families, but not always. It's kind of like breast cancer. Breast cancer tends to run in families, but not always because it's more than one gene is, is going into it. And then there's also environmental factors. Oh, okay. So for example, I can carry a gene for breast cancer and never get breast cancer uh, because I'm not exposed to um, carcinogens or um, hormones that uh, would lead to 
an increased likelihood of, of uh, breast cancer. Interesting. And lupus is kind of like that. We haven't uh -huh. quite figured out what those environmental factors are. But yeah, not everybody who's uh, predisposed to lupus would get it. Huh. Thank you. Yeah, quite welcome. Yeah, so we're working on that. We're working on that. And hopefully we can move on to these um, more complicated multi uh, gene diseases. But here's the ethical problem. Um, if I change someone's age, okay, I have made a decision for all of the people who come from that age. Okay, not just the woman's children, but also her grandchildren and her great grandchildren. Okay? Well, when you're talking about cystic fibrosis, most of the time we think, eh, let's not worry about it. You know, I doubt anybody wants to have cystic fibrosis. Okay? Um, but where you have sickle cell anemia, that in some areas that provides a protective advantage, if you carry one gene, um, you're less likely to die from malaria. Okay, so do we really want to get rid of the gene for sickle cell anemia? But if we have somebody born with sickle cell anemia or somebody born with cystic fibrosis and we go in and we fix instead of their germline, if we fix just their blood cells, okay? or we go in and we fix just their lung cells, in other words, we cure the disease without making a decision for the generations after that. Most people are not as concerned about that as they are with modifying people's eggs and sperm. Okay? There's also the concern about creating designer babies. Okay? Oops, that was supposed to be this. I almost put designer baddies. Um, so, you know, when, you know, there's the concern about people wanting to create a master race. Hate to say it, we humans, we have gone through phases where we have done that, where we have tried to breed the master race and violently eliminate through genocide the folks who do not fit into the master race. And so there, there is a real concern about you know, using CRISPR to create designer babies. Okay. So there are ethical considerations. Right now, it is illegal to use CRISPR on anybody's germline, okay, to uh, change the genetics of eggs and sperm. Okay. Meanwhile, we're working on treating the non germline of uh, patients who actually have a disease. Okay, we're working on using CRISPR. Uh, to help cure those diseases. Okay. Because the person, the patient, is able to sign a form saying, okay, yes, I do want this treatment. And it's um, hopefully will become like any other treatment. Like, say, for example, if I'm diagnosed with breast cancer and I sign a form saying, yes, I, I agree to receive chemotherapy and radiation therapy um, to, and surgery to cure my breast cancer. Um, it's, you know, giving people a choice, whereas if you do it in the germline, um, the folks who come from those eggs and sperm didn't have a choice. Okay, questions? Okay, we've got time for a couple of questions. All right. Uh, yes, I actually do have a question. Yes. Um, you were talking about, um, you know, designer babies. Is that the same um, um, uh, thing that they use to make those dogs that are just those those special breeds of dogs, or do they actually just kind of keep breeding those dogs to make those those specialty dogs? It depends upon the specialty dog. <laughs> <laughs> if you're talking about a labradoodle, then it's breeding. <laughs> I always wonder how they can get like a, like a, I don't know, like one of the big ones and the little ones together. <laughs> Maybe go. they're splicing something. <laughs> uh, you know, that one's more artificial insemination. <laughs> they have a little test tube, baby. 
<laughs> and uh, generally, either that or they'll have the smaller breed be the father, which works better biologically than having the smaller breed be the mom. Because, you know, if you're getting huge puppies, there's only so much puppy that will fit in a chihuahua. Well, they've gotten them so, I don't know. It just occurred to me. So, I mean, okay, thanks. Yeah, but they are working on, um, they have done like cute little lambs that their right. wool is pre-dyed and they are fluorescent pink <laughs> and they are just cute as anything um but those yeah that those you would do genetic engineering too, to make <laughs> pink lammies so <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> oh you're quite welcome or if you uh you buy those neon tetras those are genetically engineered interesting not neon not the original neon tetras but um like the fluorescent cichlids that you right. put you light on the tank and they glow yeah those are genetically in there oh my gosh yeah yeah so you can make them all sorts of different colors oh my gosh <laughs> isn't that cool I love that yeah Meanwhile, i'm sure some of you are going ah no <laughs> Which no, I've a um, good response. I've had cichlids, but I didn't have the neon kind. I don't have to look at those. Yeah, look up the neon ones. They're pretty I'm... cool. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt the fish at all. No, of it course not. Them. Yeah, it doesn't bother. <laughs> Meanwhile, we go, oh, cool. And we continue to breed them, which benefits the fish. Because, you know, you get more fish that have this cool <laughs> thing. And they have a pretty sweet life in an aquarium. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, no predators, you know, they've got a dating system, uh, you know, program set up for them, you know, they don't have to suffer the rejection of being out in the wild and, you know, anyway. <laughs> ah, the, the wonderful life of, uh, of pets. Okay, so let's talk about false positives and false negatives. We didn't talk about this, but we are going to have you uh, take what you know and apply it to this particular question. So what is a false positive when we're talking about COVID testing or any other testing? Okay, we're at 33%. We're almost to 50%. Ah, we're at 50%. Let's we'll see if we can get higher than that. Ah, 75%. 83. Let's see if we can get to 100. All right, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna end the poll at 83%, okay? Most of you picked that a false positive is the patient does not have COVID, but the, the test comes back that they do, okay? And you are right, that is a false positive, okay? Um, so uh, this would be a true positive. The patient has COVID and the test comes back that they do have COVID. That is a true positive, okay? So, a false negative would be the patient really does have COVID, but it comes back negative or yeah. So um, the reason why I bring this up is no test is perfect, okay? Um, sometimes you will get a false positive for whatever reason, okay? Sample is collected in, in properly, okay? There was cross-contamination between the positive control and the negative control. That's why we run negative controls to, to try to catch that kind of thing. Um, you know, and so, you know, th there have been some folks who have tested positive and later on with another more sensitive test, like a PCR test, uh, it turns out they didn't really have it. Or we do antibody testing and it turns out there's no antibody. Um, so it was likely a false positive. Um, there's also false negatives, okay? Same kind of thing. Um, the patient really does have COVID, but when they first do the test, we don't have enough antigen to create that second pink line. There's a line forming, but there's so few amounts that we can't see it. Okay. And then they take a test a couple of days later and it's definitely positive. Okay. So things to keep in mind when we're talking about, um, uh, you know, false positives, false negatives. 
Okay, here's my follow-up. Okay, which would be worse, a false positive or a false negative? Okay, so for this one, let's change this to true false. Okay, A being true, B being false. Okay, which would be worse, false positive or false negative? Okay, we've got some good early voting. Okay, we're 50%. Now uh, we're almost to 75. Oh, uh, we kind of stalled. Tell you what, just for the sake of time. All right, so everybody picked false negative. Good job. Yes, that is more of a problem. Okay, somebody who doesn't think that they're, uh, that they have COVID going around to accidentally and intentionally spreading it. So, yes, good job. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Let's do one more. Uh, let's see, let's, uh, let's see, let me switch this to, all right, which of the following DNA replication enzymes are used in PCR? So all of these are enzymes that the cell uses to make more copies of itself. Hey, we're past 50%. Good job. Now we're at 75%. 81, 90. Let's see if we can get 100%. Okay, just for the sake of time, we're going to stop at 90%. Okay, most of you picked B, DNA polymerase. Good job. That is the correct answer. Okay, so instead of heal a case, we use what in PCR? What do we use to peel apart the strands of the DNA? Starch with an H. Followed by an E. Followed by an A. So we use heat. We use heat instead of helicase. Okay. Uh, we do use primers, but instead of using primase, which randomly puts in primers, we put in stretches, primers of the area that we want to get replicated. Okay. We want more control. Okay, and then DNA ligase, actually this is the correct answer. Sometimes we put DNA ligase after we pull uh, the PCR product out, we'll add some DNA ligase, shake it up, it heals the next, and then we have a nice long stretch. Um, that reminds me on the test, I'm not gonna make this one an option. Because <laughs> we actually don't use it in the thermocycler, we use it later as a part of PCR. So if you put DNA ligase, good job, okay. All right, that is uh, it for now. Let's go ahead and go to what to do for next time. Oh, before we go, yes, there will be questions like this. So like I said, the uh, math is going to be exactly the same as what we did for um, binary fission, okay? Figuring out how many bacteria you have in the sample after incubation, except I tell you how many generations, I tell you how many cycles. So it's actually easy. Okay, so uh, the signature assignment case study is due this Friday. Okay, uh, read chapter 15, which is the last chapter we're covering this semester. Okay, that's uh, going to be on antimicrobials. We're going to talk about antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals. Okay, um, and then also the course evaluation is open. And I keep needing to put out an announcement telling you the rules, the rules of the game. So if 80% of the class does a course evaluation, for those of you that did a course evaluation, I will give you three points of extra credit. Now, the reason why I'm saying I will only do it if 80% of the class does it 
If I get less than 80%, the data is too small of a sample size and it's not as useful. So yes, I am bribing you <laughs> to do a course evaluation. I really, really want you to do a course evaluation because that's how I improve the, the course from semester to semester. Valuable information, but only if I get at least 80%. So please take some time this weekend. Yes. Okay, so, um, and I don't have a place for you to submit a picture saying, thank you for doing the course evaluation. I used to be able to go in and see which students had done one. Uh, we've changed systems, I can't do that anymore. So you have to actually submit something. So when you do the course evaluation, that end screen that says, thank you, um, go ahead and take a screenshot of that and I'll have a place for you to submit that. Okay, other okay, uh, questions. Okay, well, let's go ahead and call it good.